sorry I'm a bit late but you know I tell you um when you go off with grandkids especially as rambunctious as my three are those three um it takes a wee bit of time to recover <laughs> I'm, and I, for some reason, I think the gremlins snuck up here today, or while I was gone, and fiddled around with my desktop, because I was just, I thought, oh, I didn't have my headphone, but I took it with me, and all those things. Hi, Gloria, it's good to see you. Hi, Janice, good to see you here. Thank you, Gloria, I'm glad to be home. Also, it is very wonderful to be home, and, um, yeah, just one of those things of um I loved going oh my goodness excuse me while I clean my glasses um I love absolutely love spending time with the grandkids and was very you know pleased that my daughter asked us to come down and so that they could go out for their New Year's Eve murder mystery party that they went to and they it was at some mansion outside of Eugene is this whole big thing and then they had an Airbnb that was quite close by so that they were good safe and sane and could party and play and they got back about 10 30 or 11 the next day <laughs> pretty wiped um <clears throat> the little baby Rory did not sleep well hasn't been sleeping well the past she's decided that nighttime is her time to voice her opinion on a variety of things that she's displeased with. So um, we had some good discussion through the night. <laughs> and then Rook, the Rookinator, the Wild Rookus. Uh, rookie is just something else. She's a lot of fun, but she's a wild child. She's, I mean, she's great. She's artistic. She does so much. And then McLean is six, and he is the best big brother but um it's sometimes hard being the big brother and so we had a wonderful time though loved loved every minute with the kids and that was nice and what made it really wonderful was that we decided to take the train um hi sammy hey it's good to have you here I know, um, I know I saw Angie wasn't feeling very well at her premiere. I was um, in and out of it and um, didn't get a chance to stay on because it was in the middle of something else that we were doing here at home right then. But um, so um, I'm wishing her well. Sammy, I saw you had a premiere coming up later on tonight or that you're going live later on tonight I think uh, you did one on interviewing I think I saw that caught, caught a couple little bits on the train ride home that's the wonderful thing about riding the train hey Angie is here yes welcome I hope you are feeling better and this this will make you feel a little better so the wonderful thing about taking a train literally um, it was about a half an hour longer drive, I mean, ride on the train than it would have been for us driving. Um, and we didn't have to worry about stuff. Seats were okay, comfortable, this and that. Um, but considering when we left, there was eight inches of snow and it was freezing and it was very cold here. And I-5 was a mess to go southbound. But we got down there, it was fine. Coming home... It was pelting rain. I think we got an inch and a half of rain in a few hours. And it was pelting and it was cold, big ice drops. So it was just like 33 degrees and oh, so uncomfortable. Um, but that is the way that goes. So um, I'm drinking my tea, getting myself revitalized today. Um, oh, <laughs> you're in Gretchen withdrawal. You're funny, Angie. She says she's in Gretchen withdrawal. Well, I'm back at it. I'm back at live. I'm here. I, um, still so much to learn in ECAM. 
and to do, and um, I'm going to plan on taking you through some of those things that I learned and some of the things I've learned with Canva to do some of these things. But tonight I just wanted to do a story and I went around and I found one um, and uh, um, it, I, I wanted to, I found this book called Homebody and it's a book that I've had. It, have you ever been to one of those giant book tents that are, they have books for sale, you know, really in, in some place in somebody's parking lot. Those are usually publisher overruns from books that haven't sold very well. I picked this book up there and, um, you know, sometimes a book just is meant to come into your hands and then it comes back out at a time when it's needed. And that's what this book did for me. And so I'm really pleased because I got home and it was just really good to be home. The house was good. Um, our dog, Aldo, had a wonderful time um, staying at his buddy Bailey. She lives down around the corner and Bailey's people thought Aldo was wonderful and uh, they spoiled him rotten and he is upstairs sleeping because he's recovering from being such a spoiled little dog. <laughs> um, oh, yes, Angie, you're getting that treatment tomorrow. Oh, I'm keep fingers crossed that it's all going to go well. Um, so this story tonight, um, again, for the art part tonight, um, I thought about pulling some things out and kind of looking at them and, and what to do. But I thought, you know, this might be one of those that we could just come back to at a time and people can look at the colors or we could do some things around it. I think I'll pull some of those books, save a night for that type of thing to, to whether we do a border night or whether we do a pastels night or chalk or um, different kind of thing. This is, um, it was illustrated by Carl Swanson and, um, he has done several books uh, that um, were quite well known. He did one on um, about Alaska and some other things, but it was not easy to find a lot of things on them. And Joyce McDonald, well, let me tell you a little bit about her. I'm going to show you the, the book right now. I switched the background for the new year you like it that was a um because it also kind of matched new year's new colors uh it's also a um this is the background i have here because i have a glass tabletop and it would just glare a lot so i have different fabrics and pieces but this fabric piece happens to be a placemat that my mother wove years ago and i used to have a whole set but my mother was a master weaver. We used to accuse, accuse her of wool gathering whenever she went on trips. She traveled several places around the world to go to weaving conferences. And she went to a class in Finland one time for um, several weeks to um, spin and dye and spin the wool for a blanket that is... Um, amazing and then she wove the fabric and wove the, this wove it into a blanket this was a um set of place cloth she did and these colors were her favorite the blues she was a total blue person seafoam green and blues and stuff so i thought it was a good addition to this book called homebody um the colors you'll see are pretty muted in throughout it and you'll see how it fits with the story one of the things that i've noticed that illustrators do where's my sound levels sammy you have to make sure i my sounds are always so bad i have to talk to you sammy about what to do with this did i just do something can you guys still hear me because i don't hear myself very well up, 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 up. there we go there we go maybe that's better um so she um is it to talk how the the use of color and how they change it matches the flow of the story and i think that's a really interesting addition that is done in children's literature in context of telling the story and so 
as we go through that, that's kind of your assignment tonight, is to pay special attention to how that's done. But Joyce McDonald was the author of Mail Order Kid, a novel for middle grade readers. She's an assistant pro in, uh, pro professor of English at East Stroudsburg University, and she's completing her doctorate at Drew University. This was in 1991. She's the creator of Shoe Tree, a literary magazine for, by, and for children, and is the founder of the National Association for Young Writers, which was an amazing association, and I'm not sure if it's still around, uh, that works with children to improve their writing skills. Ms. McDonald lives with her husband, Mac, and their five cats in Warren County, New Jersey. So you can see that there's a cat on the front here. And in my thumbnail, you might have seen the cat that I found in Canva to add to this. And Carl Swanson lives in Calabash, North Carolina with his wife and their dog and two cats trained at the Art Le Students League in New York City. He's done illustrations for advertising and for numerous book jackets. It says this is his second picture book that he's illustrated and I went and looked him up and he's done more books since that time. So anyway, um, here is tonight's story called Homebody by Joyce McDonald. Even the dust jacket and the, the end paper colors are used to help promote, the, tell the story and how they ease into it. And the color of the text and the type. Homebody by Joyce McDonald, illustrated by Carl Swanson. And the dedication on this book, I think, helps with the whole thing. Uh, and you'll have to, I'm going to mm, squirrel. Um, apologize for the nails, the messy hands, but um, the three-year-old decided it was important to paint Grandma Goo's fingernails. Oh my. Let's just say I had, looked like my whole fingertips had been dipped in orange paint. <laughs> oh yes, that's okay. It came off easily. Most of them. <laughs> so this story is dedicated to the homeless and uprooted animal and human alike unto the gray cat on Stark Road and above all to my parents, JM. Let's move this up where you can see everything. And make sure you can see the whole book. I think I'm pretty good there. Oh, my T is in the way. There we go. One moonless night while the dark silence held their secret, the Peeble family stole away from their falling down house. They did not tell their landlord they were going, but they did leave him a present, a mountain of trash so high it was almost as tall as Mr. Peeble. They also left behind a dog with fur the color of a penny and one thin gray cat. The cat waited and waited. Peebles did not return. But the gray cat did not leave. Home was home. And that was that. The cat hunted mice in a nearby field without much success. And when the hunger was more than she could bear, she munched a beetle or two. The old dog tried hunting rabbits, but he had forgotten how to hunt. And so, like the cat, grew thin. Sometimes when she was lonely, the cat poked and pawed about the mountain of trash. She would pull a broken water pistol or a torn teddy bear from the rubble. The toys reminded her of the Peeble children. The cat curled up with her treasures and waited. And waited. But the Peebles did not return. Then... One warm August morning, a few weeks later, a man named Joe Budd drove a shiny pickup truck into the driveway. He was the new owner of the falling down house. I'm going to pause for just a second. Notice how the colors here, all of a sudden, the whole image becomes a bit brighter. Perhaps a shift in the story. He was the new owner of the falling down house. Joe stood with his hands on his hips and shook his head. He shook his head at the mountain of trash and at the torn screens. He shook his head at the roofing shingles that had tumbled into the ground and the uncut grass and weeds. 
Joe's plans to fix up the old house was to fix up the old house and sell it. He could see he had his work cut out for him. The gray cat hid in the nearby bushes with the dog. They watched Joe load some of the trash into this truck. Suddenly, something brushed by the cat's fur. It was the penny-colored dog. He walked slowly from their hiding place, his head bent low. Joe stopped working and stared. When the dog was only a few, away, a few feet away, Joe hunkered down and held out his hand. He petted the nameless dog and felt how thin he was. Well, Joe said, where did you come from? As if he understood the man's question, the dog lumbered over to the porch and flopped down in front of the door. Joe looked surprised and then concerned. Did they leave you behind, old friend? He asked. How would you like to come home with me? The dog wagged his tail in answer and climbed into Joe's truck. From the bushes, the gray cat watched her friend right away. But she was not about to leave because home was home and that was that. Almost every day, Joe came to work on the house and the dog whom he'd named Sam came with him. Sometimes Joe brought his young son, Brian. Together they filled a big dumpster with a mountain of trash while the gray cat looked on from her hiding place. On other days, Joe ripped off the old shingles and replaced them with new ones. He repaired the torn screens. Brian even helped to gather the old shingles from the ground. Each evening, after Joe and Brian and the dog had left, the gray cat crawled from behind the bushes and stubbornly curled into the sleep, uh, crawl, um, it curled into the sleep on the porch from the falling down house. She was going to stay even if the house fell down around her ears, because home was home, and that was that. One morning, on her way to work, Mrs. Grundy from across the street noticed the gray cat sitting all alone. She tried to get the cat to come live with her, but the cat would not budge. After that, Mrs. Grundy brought food to her every day, once, as she was crossing the road with a bowl of food, she met Joe and Bud, Joe Bud and Brian. They looked surprised to see Mrs. Grundy carrying a bowl of cat food to their house. <laughs> For me? Joe asked. Mrs. Grundy chuckled. For the gray cat, she said, but I can bring you some if you'd like. What gray cat? Brian asked. Mrs. Grundy told them all about the cat. Joe listened and looked around. He did not see the gray cat anywhere. Still, he said that Mrs. Grundy was welcome to bring food whenever she pleased. Fall was coming, and the nights were growing cool. One stormy evening, Mrs. Grundy brought a little dog doghouse, which had once belonged to her beagle, to the falling down house. As the wind and rain whipped about her ears, she set the little house on the porch and stuffed it with an old worn blanket. The gray cat weaved about her legs as Mrs. Grundy worked and purred as if she understood. The next day, Mrs. Grundy told Joe about the little house. Even though he had never seen the gray cat, he thanked Mrs. Grundy for the cat's shelter. After that, Mrs. Grundy stopped every evening on her way home from work and flashed her car headlights lights on the little house to make sure the gray cat was all right. Other men began coming to the house, men with hammers and saws, and every day the cat watched them from her hiding place in the bushes. They wore down parts of the porch, they tore it down, but not the part where the cat's house sat. More men came, men with machines. They made a lot of noise, and when they were done, half the concrete slab where the porch had been was gone. Nothing was left but a large, deep hole but half the concrete slab remained, the half with the gray cat's house. Still the men came, 
They hammered and saw as the cat looked on from the bushes. They worked all around the little house, but they never disturbed it. And when they were done, a whole new room stood where half the old porch had been, but not the half with the gray cat's house. Every night after Joe and the men had gone, the gray cat crept back to the little house and circled herself into the warm blanket. And every morning after breakfast with Mrs. Grundy, she stretched her ears to listen for the sound of the men in the trucks. And when the sound reached her, she fled to her hiding place. But she never ran far. Home was home. And that was that. Then one autumn day, Joe Bud put a for sale sign in the front yard. More people began coming to the house, people who went about frowning and nodding. The gray cat looked on. She did not know that people were thinking of buying the house. On one frosty windy night before they left for home, Joe and Brian rested a large flat piece of wood against the side of the porch to shelter a cat they had never seen. But they knew there was a cat hiding about somewhere, even though they had never met her. And they wanted to help. She's right here. After many weeks, after many weeks, the house was no longer a falling down house. It had a new roof and a new room and new windows and new screens. It had new carpets and wallpaper and it had been painted blue. Joe and Brian stood before the house and admired their work. Joe was so pleased with his new house that he brought his wife to see it a few days later. And she agreed. It was indeed a fine house. When they left, Joe took the for sale sign with him. Just before the first winter snow, the buds moved into the blue house. It was not what Joe had started out to do, but he liked the house too much to sell it to anyone else. The next morning, when Mrs. Grundy brought the bowl of food, there sat the gray cat on top of the little house. The cat licked her paws and watched Joe and Brian paint her house with leftover blue paint. It looked just like the big house. Sam the dog lay by Joe's feet. He seemed happy to be home. Well, Mrs. Grundy said, pointing to the gray cat, I see you finally met. Oh, yes, Joe said. He stroked the cat's fur and scratched her behind the ears. And the gray cat purred and purred. She's decided to let us live here with her. Ah, Mrs. Grundy said, quite a homebody, that one. Homebody, that's a good name for her, Brian said, and Joe agreed. And the gray cat stretched and yawned as if she knew what Mrs. Grundy said was true. She would never leave this house, not ever, because, after all, home was home. And that was that. And that's the story of Homebody. Oh, I'm really low. There you go. Thank you. Yay. Got it. Well, five cats. <laughs> I know. The cat in this, I mean, in the, the illustrations, if you look at the colors and how they move from the day to the night and the headlights here, I just think that it's one you can find the cat on when she's watching other things and how the cat kind of almost drifts in but is so much part of the house. The colors are so similar. The cat's over here. It's just a cool book. Oh, I'm glad it makes your eyes happy. Angie said it makes her eyes happy. Ah, it is a beautiful, 
story. A great image, such illustrations. I think, I think um, it's always amazing to watch um, different illustrators. I met um, an illustrator one time. He wrote Grandfather's Journey. It's a Caldecott winner. What's his name? Alan Say. That's right. And he lives in San Francisco. He's had multiple Caldecott nominations and wins. He's absolutely, I, I was looking to see if I had Grandfather's Story. I'll, I'll get it one of these times and it will be a story. And when I met him and we talked about, he, he was telling us about what he did with this. He's first an illustrator and he, he his book is again a 32 page picture book he spent a year and a half on the illustrations on the paintings doing the originals and doing the different for the for the book he did that first before he ever did the book and then he spent a day and a half on the story because he had spent a year and a half telling the story in his head with illustrations, by the time it came to writing it down, he knew it. And he, boom, had it out. <laughs> I was just like, oh. And it's so different because oftentimes people are not illustrators themselves and will write a book and then have, have a story and somebody else will illustrate it, as in this one. And it's, it's always kind of fun to see compare the difference on how they're done I would love to know I mean this story that she has about this homeless cat how it stuck around as she said the de dedication was um and to the gray cat on Stark Road obviously maybe something from that she remembers but yeah ah I know animals being left behind it's a it's a rough thing um go with Mrs. Grundy. <laughs> and Mrs. Grundy's pretty cool. Oh no, Angie, no crying. No crying. Yes. Um, my daughter, <laughs> Bryn, when she was little, she found a cat that a kitten that was, had either been hurt or in some way this, now this is a little girl who would pick up anything with four legs or two legs or anything moving and bring it home. Oh my gosh. Um, but she decided that um, she was going to take care of this kitty. And we had a uh, an RV parked next to the house. And um, there was kind of this little garden area and stuff. And so she, what she did was she made a house and stuff and for this like under the back of the rv where we because we were it was when we were traveling and stuff and got it and she would she nursed this cat back to health and <laughs> my husband kept going because he does all the grocery shopping and ha always has and does all the cooking and stuff and he would go to get a can of tuna fish to make tuna fish sandwiches for the girls for their lunches for whatever and and he would say I swear I had tuna fish. Where's all the tuna fish going? Well, Bryn was going and she was only about nine or 10. She was going and swiping the tuna fish cans and feeding it to the cat until it got healthy enough. Finally, she and her friend Kelsey couldn't take it anymore and the cat needed stuff. So we, she told us, so we ended up taking it down to, uh, with us to a shelter, um, not to, not, to, it was a, a rescue center and they told her what the dog cat needed for, for medicine. So we went to a feed store, to the DeYoung's feed store, got the stuff and the whole things. And she brought it back over the place and they actually taught Bryn how to feed the medication to the cat and how to do all this stuff. And so she did that. And then, um, the cat went to a, a teacher friend of mine that I taught with our music teacher at our building who loved cats, but it took Patches, was the name of the cat, about a year before it would come out from under the couch from there. But it was one of those things of Bryn rescuing the cat Patches. She's been known to rescue, I mean, Annalena's dog Stella is a dog that Bryn rescued 
off the freeway in Oregon um, that had escaped from a puppy mill uh, being a, a breeder. And um, yeah, so she's, she just does that. Um, home was home and that was that. I love that phrase. I think I need to put it on a home is home and that is that. Yes, it is a nice story. Uh, good, Angie. I'm glad you're going to be able to rest comfortably tonight. Um, yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's always, it's always interesting to see here. You know, now Bryn is, um, a mom. She has three kids. They have a hamster. They had chickens. They used to have a farm that they had raised grass fed animals and meat and all kinds of, and the kids were quite used to the animals around. And, um, it's just one of those things. Oh, my husband is back from his board meeting. And, um, but I'm hoping you enjoyed this story. It sounds like you did. It was a good one. I hadn't read it for a while. And I'm, I, this is just, this is a delight for me too, because I get to re-explore some books that I, um, that I haven't seen for a while. And, um, came out to look oh curled up asleep a fox like yeah email me a picture I'd love to show that oh right okay so everybody so think about these colors I mean there's that blue and that that green that kind of comes through in some ways but this is a really pretty color this page where it all kind of comes together I mean just the way you have that gold and blue this from this dark haziness and the dark sadness color, how the colors get brighter. And you kind of have the feeling that it's it's going to get better all along the way. Along the way. I like the papa green that she shows up in all the time. Seems to be. And the red boots. Those are cool. That rust. The house colors. I love the house colors. We have lots of houses, old houses up here that have that. I have some I want to go photograph. There's one up the way that's an old shed from like 1898 up in Long Branch. It was an old homestead and it's just, oh, I love photographing those. All right. Um, <laughs> drop a paint. They do. Yes. All of the things that drop out into your paint in just a drop. So, um, everybody. So everybody, I hope you had a wonderful evening. I hope your new years and, and the new year, even if it's starting off with a struggle, you know, we can always look forward to positive and on and on. I'm recovering with my tea here <laughs> because quite thing thing truly you know you're around a six-year-old a three-year-old and an eight-month-old and they're just no matter 35 years of teaching they're just walking little oh my gosh kids are just kids I can never come home with them without a, a sniffle or a sore throat or something like that but I'm so used to it, it goes away like that and it's so worth it for the snuggles and that I've gotten from all of them they were quite spectacular kids. I had a tea party with my three-year-old granddaughter with the tea set that had been her mom's. And uh, oh my goodness, we had a, such a fun time. <laughs> yeah, they will take my energy and I had to kind of keep it up. So we hit the train. We both, both of us kind of sunk into our seats and went, oh, glad we're not driving the five hours home, five and a half hours home through the rain or whatever. And then made it home and slept in this morning. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, sometimes I, I don't, they, for me, it, Gloria, I know you said little energy vampires, but for me being around young kids was always the thing that made my day going to school and having my first class come in or that first kid I saw off the bus or the first kid that came into the library or first one that came in my room really could make my day just 
explode into high energy. It was sometimes the adults that were the energy vampires. <laughs> and that was the tough thing. So they, um, they kind of light me up and I love it. I absolutely love it. So until next time, and we'll get another story tomorrow. I'm going to keep going as long as you guys keep coming. I'm just going to keep reading. Some of them will be live. Some of them I'll have to tape. But right now I'm going to go live for a few days. And um, we're working on a few things, learning some new things. And um, it's going to be wonderful. So until next time, keep looking for the beauty hidden in plain sight. It's all around you. And the first place to look is in your mirror. You guys are wonderful. Thanks for joining me. And...